I want to take some time to go through what, um, what, no, what we went through in the first half of the book of Mark that we covered before we went on a break. So um, the first chapter of Mark, the first verse, uh, Mark begins the verb gospel with these words, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. He declares that Jesus is the son of God. And he says, this, what I'm about to say, the story that I'm going to narrate, this is the good news of the son of God who himself came on earth to save us. And then from there on, he goes on to talk about how Jesus was, was baptized by John the Baptist. And as he was baptized, the heavens opened up and a voice came from heaven saying, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the spirit descends on him like a dove. And from there, the spirit of God leads him to, into the wilderness where he goes and fasts and prays for 40 days and 40 nights. And he's tempted severely by Satan himself, who's trying to lead him away from his plans and purposes, the plans and purposes that God has laid on him and, uh, and shows him the kingdoms of the world. And he said, I'm going to give this to you for free. You do not have to die. All this will be yours. Just bow down before me. And uh, Jesus resists that temptation. And he moves forward by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he goes, begins his ministry in power. And these are the first words he speaks. He says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's what he declares. He comes out with a cry to repent and believe in the good news. And the good news is himself. And from there, he continues his ministry. He goes from town to town. He chooses his disciples and he's performing miracles wherever he goes. And uh, there are a lot of healings that you hear of. <clears throat> we saw here the blind men received sight. The lepers are cleansed from their disease. And Jesus just doesn't heal from a distance. He reaches out, touches them these people who are considered unclean, he touches them as he heals them. And, he, and the lame come to walk. People who are paralyzed, they are made whole, they are made set free. And um, not only does he heal them, he even shows that he has authority over people's sins. And he says, your sins have healed you, now get up and walk. And he continues to demonstrate that he has authority over every sickness, every, every infirmity. And not just sicknesses, over death itself. He heals a little girl with two words, Talitha Kumi. That's what he says, which means, get up, little child. That's all he had to say. That's the amount of authority that he exercised. He does not take a break. You see that again and again crowds are building up around him but he's not interested in soaking up all the attention that he's getting he moves from one town to another and you see that one word immediately appearing again and again saying that indicating that he has a sense of urgency to what he's doing he has a clear sense of purpose to fulfilling what god the father has laid on him and not just sicknesses and diseases over nature itself. When his disciples are in trouble in the boat, he calms the seas and commands the storm to be calmed down. And not just once, he does this twice. The second time he's not on the boat, he sees the disciples in trouble in a dis at a distance, but he commands, uh, he walks towards them on water and goes to the boat and commands again for the calm for the seas to be calm and all this while all this while the disciples are wondering who jesus is they're not able to understand who he is and he also spoke 
in parables. We saw a number of parables, some of them talking about the kingdom of God, how the kingdom of God, the kingdom rules are very different from earthly rules. And you also remember that story of the parable of the sower, which talked, which spoke about four types of soils, which is really four types of people who receive the word of God. And there's one he specifically says, which is the good soil. And the good soil is the one on which the seed falls or the person who receives the word of God and he accepts it, receives it, and therefore he bears much, bears much fruit. And um, there's fruit that bears 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. And in the last few weeks before we co cl closed off in November with the expository teaching in Mark, uh, we saw that great miracle that Jesus performs where he multiplies bread. People, there were 5,000 people and they had, they had five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus was able to multiply that and feed the entire crowd who was there. He has compassion on them. On the, the first time he has... Uh, he performs this miracle. He has compassion on them because they are hungry and so they, they are actually lost. They are, they, they are lost and that's why he starts talking to them with compassion and then before, he go, before they leave him, he feeds them. And the second time he has compassion on them is because they are hungry because they've already heard the word of God for three full days and he cannot let them go. So he performs the same miracle, a similar miracle, and he, with seven loaves of bread and a little fish, he feeds them all. So he's displaying his divine nature to the people. He's showing that he is God, but he's not spoken anything about himself yet. And people are still wondering who this man is. And there's a lot of speculation going around on who this Jesus is. So Jesus asks that question himself to the disciples. And that's the last passage that we saw before um, in November, um, somewhere in the middle of November. And he asked the disciples, who do the people say I am? And you see that in um, verse 7. Jesus says, who do the men say I am? And the disciples respond saying, some say John the Baptist, and some say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And then Jesus asks, okay, that's fine. Who do you say I am? Jesus is really beginning something here. He wants them to have a very clear understanding of who Jesus is. Peter, being the spokesperson, comes forward and says, Lord, you are the Christ, or in other words, you are the Messiah. And you don't see this in the Gospel of Mark, but when you go through the same account in the um, Gospel of Matthew, Jesus commends him and says, Blessed are you, because this is not something that you've received from flesh and blood, but it's the Father of himself who has revealed this to you. And God reveals this to Peter, and yet the very instant, uh, very next instant, where Jesus starts explaining about what this Messiah is supposed to go through, about the suffering that he's going to go through. He says, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. So he, he hears all of these words and he says, this can't be. I had other plans in mind. So Peter is not sure what is going on. He, this is Peter who had the revelation by God the Father himself, who turns to, who turns to Jesus now to rebuke this Messiah. That's what it says here, that Peter rebukes Jesus. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. The very words that Jesus spoke when Satan tempted him when he was fasting, fasting and praying um, soon after his baptism. Because it was the same temptation. He wanted him to be... Um, he wanted, uh, P Peter thought there were other ways to do, to establish God's kingdom. But Jesus knew his purpose and uh, the, what, what God had already, already laid on him. And so he says, get behind me, Satan. 
And Jesus at this point knows that he has to speak to them again and again of what is to come. They have to get a very clear picture and an understanding of what things must come. Because people seem to have misunderstood what Jesus' purpose is. And that's why, that's, that's where we come to today's portion, um, today's scripture passage in chapter 8, verse 34 to verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 1. That's just six short uh, verses. Let me just read that out. Chapter 8, verse 34 from the Gospel of Mark. And on the, all the way to 9, verse 1. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, this is 9 verse 1, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. Amen. What a beautiful word this is. And let's, let's um, go through verse by verse to understand what is being spoken here. Um, in the previous passage where Peter confesses Jesus is the Christ, he's talking specifically to the disciples there. Because he's on the way from one place to another. He's going to Caesarea Philippi. And then that's where he asks this question. That's where that discussion takes place. And But here... There are two sets of people. There is the disciples, and then there are some other people as well. But it's not. I'm, it's a continuation of what's going on. But there are more people here, and he's he knows that he has to address both of them because everyone needs to know who a real disciple is. So, so all this while in the last eight chapters, Jesus is the one who's performing the miracles, and people are following him. Crowds are building up wherever he goes, and they are enjoying all the good benefits that are coming off this. Healings, blessings that are flowing in, they are fed when they are hungry, so they are all, they're receiving all of it. But they seem to have misunderstood this whole thing that they just walk around Jesus and they become disciples. So Jesus lays down the rules and he says, that's not it. There's much more to discipleship. There's much more to discipleship than to just receiving the good blessings of Christ. So he says these words um, once he's called the disciples and the people towards him. He says, whoever decides to come after me. He says, whoever decides to come after me because it applies to everyone who desires to come after him. There's no one who's left out, and these rules apply to every single person who desires to come after Christ, whoever calls himself a Christian. You are a Christian because you follow Christ. If you call yourself a Christian, these are the rules that you have to abide by. You have to do these three things. The first, den he, the, the disciple has to deny himself. The second, take up his cross. And then once he's done these two things, then he follows Jesus. It's three things. All of these things come and there's a cost attached to all of them. And that's why Jesus is saying, forget what you have seen what you have understood 
of disciple, what discipleship is. I'm telling you, you have misunderstood it. So I'm explaining here what it really is. And that's important for us to understand as well as we are seated here, that there is much more to discipleship than to just attend service, attend church. There's much more to it. It's our daily walk with God which defines Christianity for us. Each of us, if we have to call ourselves Christians, it's not in the fact that we belong to a certain denomination, that we belong to a certain church, but it's that we have given our hearts to Christ and that we walk faithfully with him and we have followed him having denied ourselves and taken up our crosses. And what does it mean to deny ourselves? It means that we no longer follow the desires and the ambitions of our own lives, but that of Christ. Christ has plans for us, he has purposes for us, and we seek to desire and understand what he wants to do from us. And that's, this is kind of quite counterintuitive to what we may have learned all our lives, and that, that we have to take care of ourselves, and that, that fr right from childhood, even now we do it to our children, that, we, yeah, we, that, that, that they need to study hard, work hard, and... Uh, and get a good job, promotions, and that's what we, we've all done. And even more so in certain cultures where, where this is ingrained into us right from when we are little kids. And some of it is true, but the main part is left out, which is that we do all of this for the glory of God, so that we may serve in His kingdom. Wherever we go, we may be able to proclaim His word. We have to break out from the patterns of what we have been programmed into thinking. The cycle can be broken and we can be, we need to get out of it from this program of thinking that we, it's, it's all about ourselves and what we do for our bettering, bettering our own lives. We need to go beyond that and we go beyond that, and that's when we realize that Christ's plan, God's plan for us, is perfect. And Galatians 2.20, Paul, having suffered much, he declares this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That's what leads us on, that Christ died for us. He laid down his life for us and he gave himself for me. And Paul knows this and he's able to say that because of this, it's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. It's no longer my plans, my desires or my ambitions. It's Christ and Christ alone. It's our ambitions that we lay down. It's also our sinful past has to be laid down. And there's no way of us walking and calling ourselves Christians if we're still walking with our sinful, walking in our sinful past. It's impossible. We have to deny ourselves the sinful pleasures that this world has to offer. Every sin is, is pleasurable. Absolutely. And I'm not talking about the sexual sins alone. I'm talking about every single sin is a matter of our desire, our choosing, our attraction towards it. Even gossip and slander, we feel more important when we do that. It's, it's like we have a better view. We are more righteous and therefore I have the right to gossip and slander another person. God hates that. Especially inside a church, God absolutely hates that. If we don't have our anger surrendered towards to God, that's a sin too. And we think that um, anger is okay. Anger is just us saying we are right 
and I have a right to be angry. And these, and you look at anything, we derive some kind of a pleasure from it, and that's why we seek it. Christ says, deny yourself these things. The former does not apply anymore. You walk forward having given those things up. We have to abandon these things. And that's why in Isaiah 55 verse 7, he declares, Isaiah the prophet declares, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. We surrender our thoughts, our ways to God and votes and seek to follow and walk in righteousness and in holiness before God. And the second thing that Jesus talks about is a person who calls himself a disciple is to take up his cross. Jesus speaks of his own suffering just a few verses before, saying that he must suffer many things. That he's going to be rejected by the elders, scribes, and chief priests. But uh, he also says that he's going to be killed. But he's not yet spoken about the manner of his death. How he's going to be killed. But despite that, he's talking about the cross here already to the disciples. Why does he do that? Why does he talk about the cross to his disciples here? Now, the, men, the, the moment he mentions the cross, every Jew understands what it is. They have lived under captivity of the Romans for many years now, more than a century, more than centuries. And therefore, they know the most cruel way of execution that the Romans preferred, that was the cross. And one of the cruel parts of that execution was walking and carrying the cross. The person who was to be hung on that cross had to carry that cross and walk. What shame that is to imagine that you know that instrument, you're going to be hung on that. You're going to be killed on that, but you have no choice but to carry that cross and be killed on it. And when, he's, when Jesus says the words, each person is to take up his cross, that's what he's saying, that this is going to be a long walk, that there's going to be much persecution along the way. There's going to be much suffering on the way as well, if I have died, if I am going to be killed on the cross, although he doesn't say it, he says, I'm going to be killed, you can expect that you as disciples also are going to suffer. And I can only imagine what Peter went through, Peter and the other disciples went through as they heard all of these things. You know, they signed up for something different, or at least they imagined that it was going to be something different. They imagined the son of David to establish an earthly kingdom, that they were going to be ruling the world like, as princesses and ministers in this world. And that's probably why some of them left their uh, professions. They saw Jesus and they, of course, they knew there was something about him, and, but, but somewhere along the way, they lost the picture. And now here they are, Instead of gaining the world, they are losing the world. And, I, and this, must have, this must have left a deeper hole in their hearts, wondering, what am I, what have I gotten into? And I'm sure many of them who heard said this, what have I gotten into? Is this the thing? Is this what I'm after? That this man... I'm assuming, I always assumed he's going to be the king of kings and he's going to be killed soon. So where does that leave me? And, and not only is he going to be killed because I am a disciple, I have no part in this kingdom anymore. I'm going to be killed and I'm going to be persecuted. So what is the point of all this? 
Even for us, as we follow Christ, it is the truth that there will be persecution. There is much, there, 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 there can be much persecution and there is much loss that we can suffer. The world will hate us. The world will ridicule us, mock us when they can. Because our principles are way different from that of the world. It's it's significantly, it's, it's another thing altogether. The virtues of this world, what they consider as beautiful things, we consider as sins. And the virtues of the word of God, the world considers as a terrible thing. So they will mock, they will deride, when they have the opportunity, they will persecute you. And people have been persecuted over every century, right from the first century until today. Christians have been persecuted. When I say Christians, Christians who fall under the definition of this requirement, those who have denied themselves, those who have taken up the cross and then have followed Christ. And Luke, in the, in the Gospel of Luke, he says, take up the cross. It, it adds some more context to taking up the cross. He adds the word daily. Daily take up the cross. We remind ourselves of our call and our purpose and the suffering that we may have to, have to go through every single day. But despite that, we choose to take up the cross. It's, there's, no, there's no strength in us. We cannot do it on our own. But when we depend on God, when we ask Him to lead us, that's when we receive the strength to take up the cross. So there's no, there's, it, this is not a reason to despair, but to know that Christ holds us. He has our backs on this. And if you come to Christ seeking prosperity, health and wealth, there were people who did that and that's what he's, that's the crowd that he's speaking to here. People who spoke, who wanted prosperity, health, the best of the world and everything they ask, they want to receive it and that's the people he's addressing here and that's what he's correcting here. You may have heard a lot of teachings and a lot of, lot of things that mislead you into understanding what Christianity is about but here it is. It's very plain and it's very simple and there cannot be any grounds to argue against this because if you have a red letter Bible here, okay, you see that everything that I'm reading today, everything that is there in this passage is in the red letter. Except the introduction where it says when he called the people, that's a narration. So everything else is in the red letter, Jesus' own words saying what discipleship is. So there's no reason to argue against this. This is his words itself. And then when you have done these things, you denied yourself, you have taken up the cross every day, then you may follow me. Then you may follow me. And following Christ is an act of obedience. Every day we come before him having left everything that we that we wanted in our lives and then we take up the cross which means we accept the suffering we walk every day in obedience to Christ and again Hebrews 8 clarifies this and says very clearly Hebrews 8 verse 10 if you would turn to Hebrews 8 verse 10 it says of the new covenant that Jesus makes with us. He says, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. This is Hebrews 8 verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on the heart, on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Amen. This is the confidence that we have. That we know right from wrong when we receive the gift of salvation. 
the Holy Spirit of God himself dwells within us. And it's no longer that we are subject to the law, but the law dwells within us and, he, and, and the Spirit of God reminds us what it is. I will put my laws in their mind. We don't have to... He gives us the spirit of discernment very clearly. We don't have to judge what is right and wrong. We know it because it's on our mind and it's inscri inscribed on our hearts. Ask God to reveal what it is. And when we come into prayer before him, that's what we're doing. We're seeking into what he has laid into our hearts already. And when we fast and pray, that's what we understand. That he opens his word to us. And he speaks clearly to us because he is our God and he and we are his people it's a prominent it's a covenant promise of God that when we receive the gift of salvation that these promises are true and therefore we're able to follow him without fear no confusion and in boldness praise God <laughs> and he goes on to say this in verse 35 Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. Notice here, Jesus says, whoever desires to save his life. A man can only desire that he will save his life. He cannot save his life. Our days are numbered and they are surely all of us will, 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 will have to face death one day unless Christ comes before that. And I think of myself, I'm at 40, 25 years ago, I was a teenager. I'm 42, but 25 years ago, I was a teenager and 25 years later, I'm going to be 67 the last days of my life but that's all life is I've worked hard and here I am and I have another 25 years maybe 30, 40 odd years at best but that's the case that's the story of all of us if this is my year 42 here was 17 here is 67 and that's the end of life that's the truth that we all face. That we all face. We can only desire to save our lives, but it's not going to happen. And the man who desires to save his life strives very hard to save his life, and nothing, nothing changes about his number of days. Nothing changes about that. And God. And, and we are programmed again. We've lived all our lives thinking if we save enough, we're going to have a comfortable life ahead. Right? And that, that's what we always think. That we save and we do well and then we're going to have a bright future. But the bright future <laughs> ends at the grave for those who think they will save their lives. But for those who who put their trust in God, the bright future is in heaven. Amen? And it's in eternity. That's where our bright future is. And so, and that's the encouragement that we take from this, that our suffering is not forever. Our joy is forever. Our peace is forever. And our fellowship with God that is eternal. And these are the things that help us move forward in faith. It doesn't matter. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. Will save it. It's a certainty. There is no two ways about it. If you have suffered for the sake of for the Gospel and for Jesus, you will save your life. 
And God, Jesus goes on to say, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What will it profit if he gains the whole world? And this is not just an, he's not talking about an ordinary man. This man who has, who has done so well for himself, he has gained the whole world. Everything you saw when you came on the way to church, everything this man owned. And everything you see on TV, all the beautiful places this man owns, all the ski resorts, all the beach houses, all the hillside resorts, all the best buildings, parks, gardens, everything this man owns. He owns the whole world. But the day he loses his soul, there is absolutely nothing that he carries with him to the grave. It's pointless to gain the whole world. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What can even that man give his, in exchange for his soul? Can he trade with God everything that he owns? God already owns it. He's only your steward of it. He cannot give anything in exchange for his own soul. And that's why Christ died for us. That life was precious. That life was much more than the whole world. That's the only thing that could have rescued that man. And that's the only hope that we have. That we give our lives to Christ. And in exchange for what, what, what do we have? What, what is it that we can bring? Absolutely nothing. In exchange for nothing, we receive eternal life when we accept what Christ has done for us. We give up our former way of life and acknowledge that Jesus is the Lord and Savior and walk with Him in truth and humility. And that's the only thing we can do. And that's not really, and our doing is not what brings us salvation. It's what Christ has already done for us. We just receive it with our hands stretched forth. And then in verse 37, Jesus, Jesus goes on to give, in verse 38, he goes on to say, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed. These are scary words to hear that um, a person who's ashamed of Jesus and his words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. But, but this is the truth. This is what Jesus speaks here. And the reason why he says this is, he speaks of the adulterous and sinful generation. He speaks of that generation where Jesus lived as adulterous and sinful. What about today? It's the exact same thing. This generation is adulterous and sinful too. And every generation that has lived in between has been adulterous and sinful. But who is not adulterous? The one who is pure. Who is not sinful? the one who is sinless, Christ himself. And it's he who saved us. And when we have come to that knowledge of his saving grace for us, how can we be ashamed of him? The adulterous and sinful generation has only one hope, and that is Christ. And every generation where Christians suffered, the next generation had something to benefit out of it. That they knew the word of God, the love of God, because, <clears throat> because of the suffering that previous generation went through for taking the word of God forward. 
But you and I, we have been given the same charge, the same commission to take his word forward. And if we are ashamed of what he has done for us in this adulterous and sinful generation, where we are supposed to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth, we are, we are supposed to do those, we are supposed to play that role, being light of the world. But if we become the world itself, how can God not be ashamed of us? It is worthy of shame. And shame is too soft a word when Jesus has done so much for us, when he has been crucified for our sins and our, he has purchased our redemption for us. But we would be ashamed of that. And so Jesus gives this very tough warning that there is going to be a day when he comes back and he is going to come back. Without a doubt, he is coming back. And that's what you see in Revelation chapter 22. If you would flip to that, please. In your Bible, the last chapter of the Bible, there are, there's a reminder that comes three times of what is going to happen. Verse 22, he says, Behold, I am coming quickly. This is verse 7 in chapter 22 of Revelation. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of prophecy of this book. He reminds us that he is coming back. And then again in verse 12, he says, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me. To give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Amen. And verse 20 again, he says, Surely I am coming quickly. And he is coming quickly. And we look forward to in hope because he is going to come quickly. And he closes with these words in verse 21. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. It's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that sustains us and carries us through, through every challenge and every difficulty. And without that, we would have absolutely no hope. We should have been crushed long ago. There's no need to hide the truth. There's no need to hide who we are from the world. We are God's children, and that's a matter of pride for us. We have been purchased for, by the most expensive thing in the world, actually something that's more than the whole world, which is the precious blood of Christ. That's what we have been purchased with. Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. And this is my prayer today, that even amongst us, as we give our lives, we will be able to do exactly, that we will be able to see the power of God present with power. Amen. The kingdom of God present with power. And, and these disciples saw that many times. In fact, once they had fully surrendered to God, you see the acts of the apostles and they walked with power and authority wherever they went. And the kingdom of God and its power was seen in everything they did. They lived a life of suffering and pain sometimes, but they were joyful and were able to rejoice through all the suffering. Through all the suffering, they were able to rejoice. And, and what, whatever loss they had, it was nothing for them. And in Philippians 3, 8, he says, uh, uh, Paul, Paul writes this and he says, Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. He's talking about his former way of life where he had the perfect stature. It was a beautiful life that he had. He had... He was the Hebrew among the Hebrews. He was well known, a, a, a highly educated and a respected person amongst the Jewish scribes. But he gave that all up. All that he had was worth nothing. 
he, the excellence and the knowledge of the cry of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered all things. And I count them as rubbish. Everything that he had earned previously, he counts it as absolutely rubbish. And that's the point that God asks, asks us to come to. And when we see the power of God coming, when we live in that power, nothing will seem like much. We will want to give up everything else. And that's what he calls us to. And as you hear these words, it may be difficult for you to understand, even for me to, to go through these verses. How do I preach this? I cannot live up to this standard. It's not possible. But take for heart from this, my brothers and sisters, take heart from this that even Peter heard these words and he couldn't accept it when he heard it. He couldn't accept it. He did not accept it. He went ahead and rebuked Jesus the first time he heard this. But it's this Peter, when he was filled with the power of God, he went ahead and preached and spoke boldly. And the first time he preached, 3,000 men came to Christ. 3,000 men came to Christ. And there, from there on, he, he didn't care about his life. It was, it was persecution after persecution that he moved on. And this man who, who, who feared suffering, who feared persecution, went on to write these words in 1 Peter 4, chapter 12, uh, chapter 1 Peter 4, verse 12 to 14. Let me read this out. Beloved, do not think it strange. This is Peter writing this. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. The fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of God Christ's sufferings. That when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached, that is if you are persecuted, troubled, admonished, rebuked for the name of Christ. Blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blessed, blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. He's able to say this. He's come a full circle. Now he's a, he's a disciple of Christ the way Christ has defined it. And despite that, from the other side, he's able to say this. From the other side of having borne the suffering and the pain and the shame, he's still able to say this, that there is joy in this, brothers and sisters. There's joy in this. You may be on the other side, but come this side. Come to my side and see the glory of Christ. On their side, we have been God has been blasphemed. But on our side, it's exceeding joy and God is being glorified. And that's what we are called to do. Praise God that he is the one who holds us and he gives us strength through suffering. And we remember that we're suffering for God's glory, the one who has purchased our, our, our life and our, our certain death. Amen. Amen.